Hello and welcome to Feeding His Sheep. Today we're going to begin a study in the Minor Prophet of Zephaniah, or Zephaniah, as the name is actually pronounced. The name comes from two words, Zephon, which means to hide or hidden, and Yah, which is part of the covenant name of God, Yahweh. But for the purpose of familiarity, we'll stick with Zephaniah. I recently heard where a pastor stood in front of a church that consisted of 2,500 to 3,000 people and asked them, how many of you have ever heard a sermon on the book of Zephaniah? Out of that large congregation, guess how many people raised their hands out of probably 3,000 people? Two. It's my goal in here at Feeding His Sheep to teach the entire Bible verse by verse, should the Lord let me live that long. And my wife and the local church where I teach all agree that these smaller, neglected books of the Bible could use some attention. And as I continue to dive into the Minor Prophets and the other books, I just constantly stand amazed at them, at the richness and the depth of them. I find it amazing that in these often forgotten books that there is so much that applies to us today and how much they are filled with end time prophecies. There's so much more than a history of God warning Israel and Judah. Much of this book, for example, is what I call double reference prophecy. Now, some of it is fulfilled in the time of the prophet, and we can see how that unfolded in history. The rest of it, though, will be fulfilled in the last days in the same manner as it did with Israel and Judah, but on a global scale. So as we dive through every verse of this compact but powerful book, keep in mind that some of this stuff has yet to pass. We are not just studying ancient history, but technically this is like reading tomorrow's newspaper. So diving right in, I think we'll go ahead and begin with verse 1 of Zephaniah chapter 1. It says, The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now, most of the prophets from smaller books we don't know much about, but here in this introduction, Zephaniah gives us a plethora of information. First, we have four generations of his lineage. It says he was the son of Cushi, so his dad wasn't a very strong guy. He's just kind of soft. No, I'm just kidding. Out of all those names, more than likely, none of those sounded very familiar until we got to his great-great-grandfather, Hezekiah. Maybe that name rings a bell. He was a king. So Zephaniah had a royal lineage. Now Hezekiah, as you remember, was one of the few good kings of the southern nation of Judah. The northern nation of Israel didn't have a single godly king, but the south had a few upon the throne down there. Not all of them, not very many, but just a few. Now the days of Hezekiah were long gone by the time of this writing, but Zephaniah tells us the timing of this prophecy by the current king during his time. Josiah. That puts the writing of this book between 640 and 621 BC, just a few decades before Babylon would conquer them and carry the nation into captivity. So Josiah was the king during Zephaniah's time. Josiah was another one of these good kings. He was extremely young when the kingdom was thrust upon his little shoulders. His father was assassinated when he was eight years old and the crown was placed upon his head. You know, that seems like it would be scary to be under the rule of an eight-year-old boy. You can imagine that he would have transfer, transformed the nation into a seven-day-a-week carnival. There's going to be a Chuck E. Cheese on every corner, video games all throughout the palace. I mean, most boys his age would only be interested in an abolishing bedtime and abolishing broccoli and adopting a frog as the new national animal or something like that. But not Josiah, not this boy. He became a king at the age of of eight. Now we're told by the time that he was 16 years old, he began to seek the Lord on his own. By the time he was 20, he reopened the temple of God, which had been closed and had been looted. And then he began sweeping spiritual reform across the nation, just like Hezekiah had done in his days. So that gives us not only the timing, which is right before the exile, but it also sets the scene for us. There would be one last revival in the land before judgment came. This young king had been busy ridding the land of all the idols and commanding the people to turn to the Lord, and that is where Zephaniah comes in, as God sends him throughout the land 
to rebuke the nation for its sin and to help Josiah set the people on the right track again. So we have the introduction to who Zephaniah is and what his purpose is. Now let's see his message that he has from God in verses 2 and 3. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Wow. Right off the bat, the message from God begins with a strong judgment that is coming. But because he is a God of mercy, he is extending warning after warning to these people. At the same time Zephaniah is prophesying, Jeremiah is doing the same thing. God wants the people to repent of their sins. But if they refuse to do so, he tells them honestly and bluntly what is going to happen. Now remember I said this is a double reference prophecy. It was fulfilled partially when Babylon overthrew Jerusalem, but it also points to the Great Tribulation mentioned in the book of Revelation. Prophecy concerning the future last days is not limited to just the book of Revelation, but it can be found scattered throughout all of the Bible, mainly in these neglected smaller books. So it begins by telling the story of the earth being made bare in verse 2. It happened to the local area of Judah several times. You know, as Babylon took over, not only did they take all the people out and relocate them, but they stripped the land of any and all forestation of any tree life. The same thing happened when Rome took over. Rome cut down the majority of the trees that were there for building projects, for making crosses, and many other things, you know, leaving the land a desolate wasteland behind them. But verse 2 goes far beyond judgment on Judah and Israel. It said the entire face of the earth. Just like when you wipe a dish clean, God is going to wipe the face of the earth clean after the tribulation. Now, if you've studied the tribulation, you're going to read about multiple earthquakes happening and these bowl judgments that's going to send hail and fire and all of these other things upon the earth. And it seems as if in every other chapter, it's a third of the veg vegetation that's wiped out. A third of the wildlife is exterminated from both the land and the sea by these judgments. Verse 3 backs that up that we just read here in Zephaniah. Birds, animals, fish, even mankind, kind of like when the flood cleansed the earth and the judgment in Genesis chapter 6. We'll get more into this aspect of judgment as we approach chapter 3 of this book. That's when the nations gather together to battle against the Lord and the remnant that, that believe and are wiped out by Christ as he returns and eliminates all those who oppose him. So let's continue on in verses 4 and 5 of Zephaniah 1. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priest along with the priest and those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven and those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom. So we have here the first of two reasons why Judah is coming under judgment, idol worship. We see the name Baal or Baal a lot in the Old Testament, but it's actually a name given to multiple kinds of false gods in the land that the people worshipped. Baal actually means Lord or owner. This was a title that was commonly assigned to many of the fertility gods and the idols that the Canaanites had and that they worshipped and the Israelites kept them after the Canaanites were gone. Another one of those mentioned was Milcom. Well, maybe your Bible translation, if you're following along at home, gives the name Malcam or Molech. It's the same thing, Milcam, Malcam, Molech. The false god was often worshipped by child sacrifice. Scripture says they made their children pass through the fire, which when I first read that on my first read through the Bible years ago, I thought, well, they're just jumping through a campfire as some sort of ritual. No, we're talking about sacrificing them. They would burn their babies. They would burn their children sacrificing them to this idol. Now we might sit here in modern times and say this is absolutely horrendous, but it still goes on today in other form. Today, children and infants are sacrificed not to Milcom, but to the God of convenience. 
to the God of reputation. They are aborted because they don't want the hassle of raising a child or the embarrassment that's coming with an unplanned pregnancy. And people around the globe choose to simply end the life of a baby. Since 1973, over 63 million babies have been aborted in the United States alone. Don't tell me that child sacrifice ended in the days of Molech. Now, we may not worship idols made of wood and stone and metal today, but idols are still present. They just become more sophisticated as time passes by. What about the idol of technology? Now, technology can be a good thing, but like almost anything, it can also become an idol if you let it. With technology, we can communicate with people around the globe. I have a friend in Turkey that I got to speak to on a video call recently, and a friend from South Africa in the same week. I mean, this kind of communication would be extremely expensive, if not impossible, you know, generations ago. So we we can communicate with people around the globe. We can access a wealth of of information within seconds. You know, I almost feel sorry for the door-to-door encyclopedia salesman. You know, Google has made encyclopedias obsolete, but I miss those things. I miss the smell of the old books and the excitement of turning to find something and then you find something else and you just learn so much. You know, my computer that I use at home has multiple Bible translations that allow me to do a side-by-side or parallel comparison just in seconds rather than having to have multiple books out. So technology can be a convenience. Technology on the computer helps me search the root meaning of certain words. We can also access teachings from most Bible teachers and preachers from around the globe. We can listen to archived messages. We can listen to messages from pastors such as Adrian Rogers, who has passed away years ago, or J. Vernon McGee, who has done the same. I think he went to be with the Lord in 1987, or more recently, in the last few days, Charles Stanley, who is a pastor that I grew up listening to. Well, I say grew up after I become a Christian. I learned so much from him in my early days of my faith, but I can still listen to all of his past messages. Even though the messenger has gone on to be with the Lord, the message continues thanks to the aid of technology. So the internet can be a good thing, as most technology can be. But when we buy the latest gadgets and then proceed to completely ignore God as we immerse ourselves in this technology, it becomes an idol. Someone once said, look at the back of half of the phones and you're going to see an apple with a bite taken out of it, just like in the Garden of Eden. Now, the Bible never calls that fruit an apple, but I can see the point that that pastor tried to make. Anything that we place in higher priority over God can be an idol. It can be anything. It can be a relationship. It can be a car. It can be a hobby. It can be a musical instrument. Anything that you place higher priority over than God in your life becomes an idol. We must be careful to keep things like that in check. Keep God number one in your life. Or as Greg Laurie is famous for saying, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Let's continue on in Zephaniah 1 and get verse 6. And those who have turned back from following the Lord, and those who have not sought the Lord or inquired of Him. So a minute ago, we looked at sin number one that Judah was in trouble over and why judgment was coming, idolatry. Here is sin number two that the nation of Judah was warned to repent of, and it's one that we also need to heed today, just like ridding ourselves of idols. That is apathy, indifference, complacency. The people before Josiah were not seeking God. The temple had been closed for years, but before we condemn the people of that time for allowing that to happen, allowing God's temple to be closed, look at the apostasy of our own nation. Church attendance is down. Conversions are down. Missions are understaffed and underfunded, and God's word is being watered down on television and on the radio, and people just don't seem to care anymore. One of the things that sometimes draws people back to God is tragedy. I remember when our country was attacked by terrorists on September 11th, more than 20 years ago. I remember seeing churches filled to capacity within the following weeks. People were hurting. People were scared. People People sought answers. They sought comfort. People sought the Lord. But in the weeks that come, 
attendance and membership soon dwindled and went back to their previous places. Once things were going good, people tend to forget about God. But when trouble arises, guess what? They call out to the God that they have neglected. So God's warning these people through his prophets that he is about to allow calamity to strike them. He's going to get their attention one way or another. Now this prophecy also travels through the ages and into the future. That is the purpose of the Great Tribulation, to get the attention of Israel, who has rejected the Messiah, largely. It's referenced in Scripture as the time of Jacob's trouble. So this nation will eventually wake up and realize that they have rejected him, and they will turn to him. Now, not likely the entire population, but I'm sure a large portion will. And there's always going to be a remnant that's preserved through judgment. This is also predicted in the book of Zechariah, and is closely connected with the battle of Armageddon, in which the Lord will destroy all the nations who oppose the Lord during the tribulation. In Zechariah chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, it says, And in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like a bitter weeping over a firstborn. On that day, complacency will be a thing of the past. It will have ended. Let's go on into verses 7 through 11 of Zephaniah. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Then it will come about on the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. And I will punish on that day all who leap on the temple threshold, who fill the house of their Lord with violence and deceit. On that day, declares the Lord, there will be the sound of a cry from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. So this phrase, the day of the Lord, that has a dual reference, both the time that Babylon becomes a tool of judgment upon Judah and also during the great tribulation. That's also known as the day of the Lord. Now here where it said the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, he has consecrated his guests. The guests themselves will be the sacrifice because judgment is coming. It's going to be totally devastating, swallowing up the entire nation at that time and the world when God's wrath consumes everything at the end. It will be the same way. Look at verse 8 where God says, I will punish the princes, the king's sons. This actually come to pass and you can find this account in 2 Kings chapter 25 beginning in verse 5. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought, brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and he passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, then put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon. You know, that's just terrible. The last thing that that king saw before his eyes was taken was the slaughter of his sons. Exactly what was predicted here in this book just a few decades before it happened. Then verse 9 had this strange phrase about leaping on the threshold. That one took a little research. I've heard a lot of people just simply say, we don't know what it means when it talks about leaping upon the threshold. But you know, I, I love chasing rabbits when doing a study. I think of them as a side quest when preparing a study. So to get to the meaning of jumping on the thresholds, we got to begin with the context in which it was spoken. What had just happened? God had declared judgment on them because of idolatry. There was actually a custom that began with the Philistines, with one of these false idols, one of these false deities that they worshiped. This is found in 1 Samuel chapter 5, and the setting is the Philistines had just stolen the Ark of the Covenant. In 1 Samuel 5, starting in verse 2, it says, Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. When the Ashdodites arose early, 
early in the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left of him. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor all who entered Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. So thus began the practice, the superstition of jumping over the threshold. Apparently, some of the people had carried this superstition into Judaism and done the same things when the temple was still open, kind of like in our childhood where we made a habit out of not stepping on a crack in a sidewalk or not walking under ladders or any other of these superstitions that people have. It was a pagan superstition that the people of Judah had adopted that originated with the Philistines. Now, one more detail I want us to look at before moving on. That is the phrase that verse 11 began with, Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar. Now, your translation instead of mortar may say Maktesh. Either one, it's the same thing. It refers to this small valley that's outside of Jerusalem. It's alongside of the temple, and some people used to set up there. Some vendors used to set up and sell things. In the remains of that area today, there's a piece of the original structure from that time that is left. The very place that God said, Wail, O inhabitants, that place is known today as the Wailing Wall. That's a popular place that people visit every day. Is that a coincidence? You be the judge of that. Let's go ahead and go on to verse 12. It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps. And I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. That phrase that the Lord used is very descriptive, stagnant in spirit. When I hear the word stagnant, I usually think of a puddle of water in a dry riverbed, you know, something in the low bottom lands. That water usually has a slimy coating on the top. It's kind of like a lime green or a pea green, and it's just usually disgusting. And if something stirs that water, if you throw a rock in it or an animal runs through it, there's that pungent smell that hits your nose and it just makes you want to gag. You know, that's what I think of when I think of stagnant. I think of a puddle of water. That is the way that these people who were spiritually indifferent appeared to the Lord. Repulsive, stinky, undesirable, useless. You know, water like that isn't very desirable and neither is a person who is spiritually stagnant. In the book of Revelation, Jesus actually rebukes a church that some of the people had become spiritually stagnant. He calls them lukewarm. A modern definition would be what we call people who ride the fence. You know, they're they're between believing enough to repent and flat out rejecting Christ. They're trying to find a middle ground. But Jesus makes it clear that there is no middle ground. You know, so that's why he uses the phrase lukewarm. Now, like coffee... Faith is only good if it's piping hot, or some people prefer it cold. Why? I don't know. I cannot stand that. So if you like cold coffee, that's fine. If you like hot coffee, that's fine. But what do you do when you grab a cup cup of coffee that's been sitting around for a couple days, and you get a mouthful of lukewarm nastiness? What do you want to do? You're going to spew it all over the place. Look what Jesus said he will do to the lukewarm people in Revelation 3 verses 15 and 16. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Some translations say I will vomit you out of my mouth. Such strong language. There is no room in the kingdom for those who are spiritually indifferent. Think people who are spiritually stagnant. Those who do not care about the things of God. Let's continue on and get verses 13 through 18. Moreover, their wealth will become plunder and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses but not inhabit them and plant vineyards but not drink their wine. Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. 
a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath and all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy for he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. Wow, verse 13 begins with a scenario that may evade meaning to many of us today, but to those native to Israel and to Judah, or at least familiar with Old Testament customs and phrases, they knew exactly what these phrases meant. They're going to build houses and not inhabit them, or plant vineyards but not drink their wine. In the nation of Israel, under the law that God gave to Moses, there are three exemptions that permitted a man to stay home in times of war. One of them was becoming a new homeowner. Another one was being a newlywed. And the third was having just planted a vineyard. So let's just take a moment and look at this in Deuteronomy 20, beginning in verse 5. The officers also shall speak to the people, saying, Who is the man that has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him depart and return to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle, and another man would dedicate it. Who is the man that has planted a vineyard and has not begun to use its fruit? Let him depart and return to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle, and another man would begin to use its fruit. And who is the man that is engaged to a woman and has not married her. Let him depart and return to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle and another man would marry her. But according to this prophecy right here, that's not going to matter. Judgment is coming, and it's coming upon them so rapidly, there's no time to prepare, and there will be no exemptions. It's coming upon them like a flash flood. Now, did you notice verse 15 sure had a lot of D's in it, didn't it? Darkness, distress, desolation, despair. despair. The darkness part was mentioned twice. Now, interestingly, this also happens during the judgment that comes at the end of the tribulation. Let's look at the words that Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. In Revelation 16, which also coincides with this, it mentions seven final plagues that will come upon the land. There's many of them, but these are the last seven. And some of them are similar to the ones that God brought upon Egypt before the Exodus. There's going to be painful sores upon those who receive the mark of the beast. There's going to be seas turning to blood. There's going to be rivers becoming blood, which affects the food and the water supply. It says that the sun will become intense and will scorch people and burn people. It mentions the Euphrates drying up, which allows the Antichrist and his army to advance on Israel. It mentions 100-pound hailstones, thunder, lightning, and earthquakes, and then darkness over the entire kingdom of the Antichrist. And it describes this darkness as so thick it is literally painful. Well, Revelation 16.10, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their, ta- gnawed their tongues because of pain. Now, people will look at passages like we just read here in chapter 1 and say, how can a God of love do this? How can he bring such destruction upon people? Well, God has always, always been more than fair. Here he is warning the nation for the umpteenth time, almost a quarter century before it comes to pass. Now, whether or not they heed the warning is upon them, but they were warned. The same goes for all of us today. The day of the Lord is coming. You know, not the past one concerning Babylon, but the future great tribulation. And even if that happens far into the future, you're still going to have to face the Lord when you close your eyes in death and wake up in his presence for judgment. So he's been warning us through both the Old Testament and the New Testament that the day is coming. We've had thousands of years to heed all of these warnings. He is not willing that any should perish, but that people should repent. 
repent and follow him. But every single day passes by until then, many more people are making the decision to ignore God, to ignore his warnings. People today don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to give up their favorite sins. You know, they want to hear all the good things about heaven and about love. Don't speak to us about hell, fire, and brimstone. That's old fashioned, you know. But they just don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to give up their sins. And God, being the perfect gentleman, will honor their wishes. He's not going to enforce himself upon anyone. And if they're not thrilled with assembling with other believers and worshiping God here on earth, they're not going to like it doing it in eternity either. But they will definitely not be able to say that God didn't warn them. They will not be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know, because they knew. He gave them warning after warning, sermon after sermon, and that Bible sat right there unread, untouched all of these years. He cannot say to, they cannot say to God that we didn't know. We can't say that God did not warn us.